Since 1854, the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception have responded to the needs of the poor, the orphan, the sick, and the elderly with care and compassion. Over the years, they have provided education, health care, and social services to those in need, first in New Brunswick, then later in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and here in British Columbia, where they founded St. Vincent's Hospital which has grown from a 250-bed multidisciplinary facility to a provincial leader in the provision of extended care and geriatric medicine. They also built a comprehensive extended care facility at St. Vincent's Langara and administered other extended care facilities at St. Vincent's Arbutus and the Veterans Facility at Brock Farney Pavilion. The story of the remarkable achievements of the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception begins in 17th century France with the work of Vincent de Paul, who helped slaves and prisoners, the poor and the sick, with a spirit of humility, simplicity, and charity. Vincent de Paul was born in 17th century France to a poor peasant family, where he grew up experiencing poverty firsthand. He entered the priesthood at age 20, and while sailing from Marseille, he was captured by Turkish pirates and sold into slavery. Vincent was later freed when he converted his owner to Christianity and returned to France. There he dedicated his life to the care of the poor, sick, enslaved and the abandoned. With the help of the venerable Louise de Marillac, they assembled a group of country girls to serve the poor as cooks, nurses and teachers that were to be known as the Congregation of the Daughters of Charity. In 1809, an order of the Sisters of Charity was founded by Elizabeth Ann Seton in Emmitsburg, Maryland, using the rules that St. Vincent had drawn up for the sisters in France. And it wasn't long before other orders began to appear in North America. In Canada, by 1847, more than 17,000 immigrants, mainly poor, illiterate Irish, had reached St. John, New Brunswick in search of a better life. The Bishop of St. John at the time, Thomas Connolly, took up the challenge of providing for these poor immigrants, many of who were orphan children in need of education. He first traveled to New York to seek assistance from the Sisters of Charity at Mount St. Vincent on the Hudson, who were unable to provide sisters to help him at that time. Later, an outbreak of cholera in St. John left many more children sick and orphaned. Bishop Connolly appealed again to the Sisters of Charity in New York on behalf of the orphans. A group of four novices volunteered to help and arrived in St. John in September 1854. The group was led by Honoria Conway, known as Mother Mary Vincent. Honoria Conway was born in Galway, Ireland. She originally had immigrated to St. John, New Brunswick, but later settled in Nova Scotia. At the age of 37, she entered the Sisters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul in New York. When she and her three companions answered the call for help from Bishop Connolly, they traveled to St. John and continued their spiritual training under him. Once in St. John, they began the task of establishing an orphanage and organizing a new religious community. They tell us um, that Honoria was a woman of vision, a woman of compassion, uh, very sensitive, and very kind, especially to the young sisters. She uh, was not afraid to give them a hug. She often um, treated them on different occasions. And also, she would preach to them about charity and being very humble and simple as they served one another and served the people in that area. She also um, had a favorite expression, lost tales which means praise the Lord. In 1854, four women pronounced their religious vows as the Sisters of Charity of St. John, 
later to be known as the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception, the first English-speaking congregation founded in Canada. The work of the Pioneer Sisters prospered, their numbers grew, and they opened institutions in the education, social services, and healthcare fields in New Brunswick, including a number of schools and homes for the aged. In 1906, an appeal to care for orphans took the sisters to Saskatchewan, where they cared for the orphans at St. Patrick's Orphanage in Prince Albert. Later, they established the Holy Family Hospital in Prince Albert, the first hospital undertaken by the order. In 1914, the sisters opened a second hospital back in their foundation city of St. John, New Brunswick. The St. John Infirmary later became known as St. Joseph's Hospital. It was followed by the opening of schools in Edmonton, Alberta, and Hold Fast, Saskatchewan. In 1929, the sisters were called by Archbishop Duke of British Columbia to play a part in bringing Catholic education to British Columbia. The sisters responded by opening five schools in Vancouver and Burnaby, as well as a home and refuge for unwed mothers. In 1937, the health care facilities in the city of Vancouver were inadequate. Archbishop Duke again appealed to the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception in New Brunswick to help meet the needs of the sick and suffering by building another Catholic hospital. The Superior General of the Sisters of Charity called on Sister Ruth to undertake the project. Helen Ross, known as Sister Ruth, was born in Nova Scotia and entered the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception in 1917. During the 12 years after her vows, she enrolled in nurses training and acquired a wealth of administrative experience working at Sisters of Charity institutions in New Brunswick. She arrived in British Columbia in 1931 as superintendent of St. John's School for Boys in Burnaby, British Columbia. She certainly was a mover and a shaker because she made things happen in a very casual manner. Everybody that knows Sister Ruth would uh, be all the better from speaking with her because she had so much wisdom and she was a very, very compassionate, caring person. The Superior General of the Sisters of Charity called upon Sister Ruth to research and begin organizing the building of a Catholic hospital in Vancouver. Her first job was to find an appropriate site for the 200-bed hospital. She first considered building on land already owned by the sisters at 54th and Oak Street, where they operated a home for unwed mothers. However, when the surrounding property owners objected to the required new zoning, they purchased an alternate site at 33rd and Heather Street for the sum of $11,800. Many of the people felt that uh, it was not a wise decision that nobody would ever, ever venture to St. Vincent's. The only building here was the um, RCMP building. There was no sidewalks, there was no running water. And uh, who would ever venture to St. Vincent's Hospital? So they proceeded and uh, they uh, would leave uh, the lights on at night to let people know that they were around and very much alive. And it wasn't within, any time, within a matter of days that they um, had a 41 patients. With a budget of $160,000, construction of the first phase of the projected 200-bed hospital began in August 1938 and was completed in May of 1939 with the opening of a five-story, 100-bed hospital. Sister Ruth was appointed administrator and superior with a staff of 15 sisters, all experts in their special fields of work. To prepare for her new position, Sister Ruth earned a certificate in hospital administration in Washington State. The hospital included operating rooms, maternity, pediatrics, x-ray, pharmacy, laboratory, and medical records departments. The spirit and tone of St. Vincent's was set by the generous, faithful dedication of a team of compassionate, caring young sisters under the leadership of Sister Ruth. Each department was managed by a sister who had a strong influence on staff as well as patients. During the early years of the hospital, there were many struggles. At times, the hospital lost money through its operations. 
However, at a time when public health insurance was unknown, the sisters accepted all patients, regardless of financial standing. In 1957, Sister Ruth was transferred to St. Joseph's Hospital in New Brunswick and was replaced by Sister Marion MacDonald, who served until 1980. Michael Higgins became the first lay administrator. With the declining number of sisters in leadership, the trend towards sister-sponsored rather than sister-operated institution became the norm of the day. The spirit of St. Vincent's continues, partly due to the fact that for the first 41 years, the leadership was held by two sisters. The initial spirit of service was laid by the team of young, dedicated religious women who helped to establish St. Vincent's. Among them, Sister Rita Lynch, who in her 55 years of service at St. Vincent's set up many of the key departments, including central purchasing and human resources. Sister Margaret Schell, Sister Josephine, who from the opening of the hospital and many years following, was responsible for the provision of dietary services. With limited finances, she was able to not only provide good meals, but also managed a Christmas cake gift for each of the staff annually. They tell me a story, uh, one of the nurses tells me a story, she's still living, that in, Sister Ruth interviewed her for a job. She had come over from Ireland, and Sister Ruth said, Right presently, uh, I don't have any work, but um, I have your phone number, and when something turns up, I'll call you. So this day of the afternoon, uh, this nurse got the call, and she said to Sister Ruth, I'm sorry, I can't go. I have no babysitter. I have no uniform. I have no shoes. Sister Ruth said, bring your baby, bring yourself. When you come, I'll have a uniform for you. I will have a pair of shoes for you and a babysitter. We need you. We need your talents. So she um, was able, able to meet every situation and um, provide what was necessary to make it happen. In 1952, the sisters began the second phase of the hospital, a 100-bed, six-floor wing bringing the capacity of St. Vincent's Hospital to 237 beds. While the sisters borrowed money for the construction, the provincial and federal governments also contributed to the cost. As construction continued, many fundraising events were held to purchase equipment and furnishings for the new wing. In the 1970s, St. Vincent Hospital expanded again. In 1972, construction began on another wing of the hospital to include geriatric psychiatry and extended care facilities. And in 1974, the new West Wing opened for service. Since that time, the sisters have been called on many times to serve the needs of the public. In 1976, the sisters were asked by the government to take over the administration of a private hospital and nursing home of 75 beds. St. Vincent's Arbutus site met the extended health care needs of the elderly until its closure in 2003 as part of the Providence Healthcare Legacy Project. In the late 80s, the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception were approached again by the government to build and operate a 225-bed extended care facility. St. Vincent's Langara site opened in 1991 and currently provides the best in extended care service to a multicultural population of elderly residents. When Shaughnessy Hospital closed, St. Vincent's Hospital was asked to assume responsibility for administration of the Brock Farney Veterans Hospital. The increasing number of elderly with their special needs was the inspiration for the sisters, and they continued to respond to the changing needs of the times. The spirit of compassionate care for which St. Vincent's is recognized was laid by the dedicated team of young sisters under the leadership of Sister Ruth and Sister Marion MacDonald. They believed that spirit is caught, not taught, and so the staff of St. Vincent's continues to carry the same dedication to the philosophy of the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception. The recognition of the dignity of each person as a child of God, redeemed by Christ. This is the legacy bequeathed by the sisters to those who will carry on the role of St. Vincent's. We were here 
to show compassion, caring to our residents, and to be very um, accepting of everybody that came to our door. And that spirit, we'd like to see the spirit passed on, especially of compassion, that uh, no one is better than, everyone's equal, that we're all equal, all, we're all here together. And uh, I think it's important that the people realize that, that we were women of charity, in simplicity, meeting the needs, meeting Jesus and the person of the poor. And I think we're all poor in different ways. So I'd like to see that spirit that permeated our um, facilities throughout the years carried on.